you're listening to The Sower, a podcast of the Ciceronian Society. The Ciceronian Society is a community of Christian scholars and public intellectuals committed to the examination of three core themes, tradition, place, and things divine, and the role in the intellectual discipleship of the church and civilization generally. To learn more about us, our events, the podcast, our journal, Pietas, to sign up for our newsletter and to make your tax-deductible gift, please go to ciceronianssociety.org. That's C-I-C-E-R-O-N-I-A-N-S-O-C-I-E-T-Y dot org. We also want to remind our listeners that our annual conference will be held February 29th through March 2nd, 2024 in Plano, Texas, and proposals are due by September 1st, 2023. Check out our website to learn more. I'm Josh Bowman, Vice President of the Ciceronian Society, and this is part two of my interview with David Michael Phelps, President of the Harmel Academy in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Harmel Academy is a Catholic post-secondary trade school with an exciting and very Ciceronian-ish mission. Enjoy. It, it, it's so interesting. I mean, I I I taught at, at the university level uh, multiple humanities courses, and it it strikes me that the the students who did the best they seem to have. How do I say this? They they were aiming at they they weren't aiming at getting a good grade as much as they were aiming at. Well, I just really want to understand this and talk about it. I want I want to be able to meet with my professor and talk about these things in, intelligently. Not because I want to impress them, but because I want to figure stuff out. Um, and that was so it, – it, it, it's refreshing to hear you say that in this environment where um, these men, are they're, they're not trying – you know, maybe there's, a, there's an element of trying to impress people, but that's not always – it's not always a bad thing. Um, and it's – Well, I, I find – you know, just – sorry to interrupt. On that yeah. point, what's very interesting – is that's actually one of the secrets, I think. Now, I'm going to say mm-hmm. something wildly overblown, okay? Uh, but, but maybe there's a, maybe there's an, a, I think there's a, a nugget of real truth in it, is um, at least in my experience, I, I, I'm starting to wonder if the skilled trades might be the salvation of the humanities. Hmm. And, and, and one of the reasons I say that is because I think one of the reasons these men have been able to be so successful is because in the world of work and in the world of skilled trades, uh, the idiom works differently. If you're a fella who puts on airs like you do know something, holy cow, you are going to be called to the mat hard on it. That's just the culture. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so the fella yeah. who tries to BS or who, you know, in classical terminology, we might say the, the, the guy who, who lacks docility, right. that guy will not make it in that culture. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He, so there is sort of a, a there's a culture of humility that's more baked into the culture. And, and, and there's lots of interesting reasons for this, not least of which is because skilled tradesmen are forced to deal with what we call proximate reality, the, the, the concrete thing here in front of me. And as Crawford uh, likes to say, that sort of reality pushes back against you. It humbles you, right? Yeah. It, it, will, you know, it will bloody your knuckles. And, and you, can't, mm. you can't blame you can't somehow say that, well, reality's wrong, and I'm going to identify as someone who, uh, other than this reality, right? Uh, no, you don't, mm-hmm. you, don't get that. you don't get that out in the skilled trades. You don't get that out in the world of manual work. Reality pushes back. And so if you're someone who doesn't have a habit of approaching reality with humility and docility, well, you won't make it very long. And that, is, that has conditioned the, the culture around work, and then when that culture becomes the occasion to look at the humanities, I think you can go farther faster because mm-hmm. there really isn't a whole lot of um, I'm trying to impress people. And again, I agree, that's not always a bad thing. But I think for a, for a student and for a young fella especially, um, it, it, isn't, it isn't always uh, easy for them to find a place where they're, listen, I was a young guy, so I can feel free to say this. Young guys are stupid. Right, they can be really <laughs> dumb, okay, and mm-hmm. but what's difficult is that they enter into a world where that's not okay to be that. But if you enter into a world where it is okay to be that, and it's kind of expected of you as long as you own it and you're willing to change, I think it's actually a place for men to flower. And I think in that soil, I think the humanities can grow. Uh, I think it can flourish. That. <laughs> trying to find something to disagree with to make the conversation more interesting, but I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> it just, it's just so it, it's to, to me, this is just going back to the very beginning of this conversation where, when, 
when you heard about this idea and you're like, it's no one needs to convince me that this is valuable. What you just said, you just said. seems eminently true. And I think this is true in, on different areas of life as well. I, there's a, uh, I can't off the top of my head, it's not on my desk right now, but there's a book about the spiritual life and how this monk comes, uh, just to give an example, this monk comes back from all this time in, in isolation, basically doing a, being a hermit and, and seeking God. And he comes back to learn that his mother, who had been working really, really hard in the home, in some ways was more prayerful and more spiritual than he was. And, w- and what he admits is that, you know, she, this kind of hard reality that she's facing every single day, this is, this is uh, centuries ago, um, that th- the challenges of motherhood in, in her time and of just running a home, for example, were, uh, they, they, were for- they were formative and instructive, and she was reflective, and she, and she knew how to think through these things in ways that he thought, you know, at least, at least for him, um, he, he couldn't get to. Uh, which I thought was such an interesting uh, contrast he, he made. I also was, you know, just listening to you talk about this, the need to um, expand beyond the trades in, in a way, the, the trades as you're describing them. I was thinking about how, and this goes back to a lot of Ciceronian society themes of, of agriculture, for example. You know, I don't know what it would look like uh, precisely, and I'm not the one to do this, but an agricultural school that's basically doing the same thing you're doing but with agricultural skills, yeah, that's interesting. You know, um, would be a, an interesting development from this. Um, well, there, there's a. I think there's a number of things to, to say there. I mean, there, there, there's there's about five branches. Um, if you don't mind, let, let's come back to the question of the other schools because that's one that's n- near to my heart because it takes a lot of my attention these days. Which which we'll say more about here in a moment if yeah. that's okay. But I want I want to go back to this question of. Um, I, I, you know, there's there's two things. I want to talk about that mother, but even before that, I want to talk about this idea of well, what is there to disagree with here? Well, I, I'm going to give you plenty of things here, right? <laughs> Let's do it. Um, because uh, uh, one of the one of the real dangers of this, and, and actually, so actually, let me take the school question, the additional school question, and this one uh, together. Okay. So um, it's it slowed down a little bit here this summer, but for about the last uh, about the last year. Uh, we average one phone call or email a week from somewhere in the country saying, would you please help us start a school like that here? Or would mm-hmm. you consider uh, you know, having another campus, what you're doing here, right? All over the country, a diocese all over the country. And these are, these are diocesan schools. These are startups. These are high schools. These are other post-secondary educations, colleges and universities inviting us to come do this where they are. It's a little overwhelming. We, we just can't help it. But what, what it says to me is, is that yeah? This is this is clearly a need, okay? Mm-hmm. But here's and here's uh, what I feel it's a little bit my responsibility to say. First of all, yes, we we, we would love and talk to anyone and help how we can in any way. In fact, it's in our founding documents that we are open. Whatever we can do to help others do this work, we that's our mission, okay? Yeah. W- whatever we can do, right? While we're also doing our own thing, right? Yeah. But <clears throat> but one of the things about that is is that it has to, it has to be understood is that you and I are having this conversation here um, and we, 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 we talk about these things and it sounds lovely and it is lovely. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I tell people is beware the temptation of romanticizing it. Right. Because um, what we're actually talking about here and when we talk about the work in the skilled trades, we're talking about work that's hard, is very often very dirty and uncomfortable um, oftentimes very repetitive and, and sometimes hard to see uh, the, the, the sanctifying uh, possibility of it, aside from the toil aspect of it. And, um, and it's also the sort of thing where it's easy to romanticize uh, what we're talking about as some sort of return to the Shire, right? Right. Um, I am a uh, huge... Tolkien fan. I wrote my master's thesis on the Lord of the Rings, so I'm a nerd. I, I've got my nerd card, right? This is before. Way to go. This is before the film. So, man, I got old school nerd fed, <laughs> okay? And, um, uh, but, it, it, and, and as, there's an aesthetic side to this that I think is true and good, but then there's also, I think, a romanticized aesthetic side, aesthetic side of it as well. I, I am all in favor, for example, of people relearning old crafts. 
I have no problem with that. Okay? But we also have to be careful to understand that in the same way that I, I myself am also a fan of people going and studying uh, philosophy in college. I'm a big fan of that. But at the same time, we have to be very discerning and prudential for any given student about, uh, well, you know, why are you going to do that? Are you going to do that because you think it's going to be an in a uh, high demand skill set in your community? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, as far as your job, right? And mm-hmm. the same thing goes when it comes to the, the trades. Um, if, if, if you would like to uh, become a, uh, a crafter of bespoke furniture, I say to you, God bless you, go with God, that's excellent, wonderful. But you know what? <laughs> it's not much of a market in that. When we're talking about the skilled trades, we, we also have to understand, like, no, no, no. Even things like manufacturing has advanced so much in the last 50 years that people think of manufacturing like a smoky room on the battleship Potemkin. They don't understand that we're talking about highly sophisticated, robotic, automated, and integrated systems within a manufacturing field, right? right. So we have to be responsive to the actual needs of our community. We have to know, you know, uh, for, this is, for example, like, I, I doubt, I'm not saying this for sure, but I doubt Harmel Academy, for example, we probably won't, if we ever had a, say, a plumbing program, which I doubt we will, but it's probably going to be a ways off, simply because the mode of training doesn't exactly fit our model, and that's fine. And the demand doesn't exactly, where we are, isn't exactly there in the way it is in manufacturing. So we have to, we have to beware not to um, romanticize this, and it's important to be sort of linked into local business and local need. Now, I, but, but, so, I, 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 that's all a, a preface and a warning of saying, let's not overly romanticize this. But, when it comes to the, to the mother and her ability to progress in the spiritual life, um, I, I'm certainly not going to, nor am I prepared to, nor am I qualified to take up that, the, the old, you know, Catholic Protestant debate about the evangelical councils and the, you know, which lives are more perfect than others. Right, right. Yeah. But, 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 but I do think that there is, uh, there's, there's a wonderful book by von Balthasar called, uh, 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 I think, The Life of the Laity and the Evangelical Counselors or something like this. That's not mm-hmm. quite right. And his point, I think, is one that the modern world, especially modern Christians of all stripes, need to take account of. And he says that the evangelical councils, whether or not it's a formal way of life in religious life, poverty, chastity, and obedience, right? Um, let's just put aside the question for a moment about whether or not the, the formal life of the evangelical councils is more perfect. Let's talk about what the evangelical councils are. And one way of understanding what they are is simply the way our Lord lived. And he lived with, um, he lived in, in, in poverty, which one way of understanding that is, is just an open-handedness. Um, uh, he, he lived in uh, obedience, which is his whole life was oriented to do the will of his father. And he lived in chastity, which another way of understanding that would be to say he saw the world with complete vision. He wouldn't fragment people, right? And this is ultimately, in, on chastity is fragmenting the unity of a person because you're only interested in part and not the other, right? Hmm, okay. And... and his point is, is that whether or not you're taking vows to these things, at the core, uh, these dispositions is the call of every Christian, is to live a life of not being attached to the world, of seeking to do the will of the Father, and seeking to love. And he advocated, this is the 50s or 60s, he advocated that we needed to start building our sense of secular vocations around these categories, not necessarily in any formal way where we're creating new orders or something like this, right? But, but, um, but that a reorientation of all of our vocation around the imitation of Christ and how he lived. Now, I, I think this is really uh, a powerful idea, and I think when you situate it in the life of the day-to-day world, especially in the work-to- work-a-day world, uh, I think it really begins to catch fire. Because at the end of the day, you know, um, again, putting aside the debates around contemplation and action and the monastic life and the secular life, um, the reality is, is that, you know, our Lord, you know, as, as the Vatican, the Second Vatican Council says, and John Paul was fond of, of uh, repeating, uh, 
Christ revealed God to man, but he also revealed man to himself. And the incarnate life of our work of taking out the trash and changing diapers and cutting down trees and you know putting putting wood away and cutting metal and uh, manufacturing automobiles and these are part of the incarnate life and the incarnate life is is best illuminated by the life of our lord and, and as one who lived in in open-handedness and, and, and a proper detachment to, to uh, the world, as one who lived in obedience to the will of the Father, as one who lived in love and wholesightedness and seeing every individual around him, that is the, uh, that is the, the warp and weft of every vocation, or it should be, especially mm-hmm. for, for us Christians. That's what we're called to. So, it, it, yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, the, the, the young monk who comes home and discovers, wow, my mom can be holy too, um, the fact that it is a surprise, that such a thing could be a surprise, or even that it works anecdotally to, de- to describe the type of surprise we may all have, mm-hmm. to me, that's evidence that we're in dire need of, of this sort of thinking about our daily lives. Right, right. I, there's there's a couple, several things, I'd, and I'll, we'll finish, and kind of, and I'll let, give you a chance to respond to this, because there's several things that I thought of as you were talking, uh, namely that there's something profoundly liturgical about what we're talking about, in mm. a sense. Now, I don't want to call everything liturgy because that that, that has its own problems, but um, because it's liturgy is is the work of the people, mm. and that that is and so it, it, kind of seeing so much of your life as you know it, where, where this separation between what are the better you know the via uh, how do you say it via act, activa via contemplate con- contemplatio. <laughs> Um, uh, talking is hard and, uh, that, that this, that when we understand so many different aspects of our life as, as serving, serving Christ as, as, as moving in this direction, it, it, it makes that separation less and less, um, important, uh, in, in a way. Now we're all different and we're supposed to be different, but, um, I think there is an a- a- aspect in which this, this work can be sanctified. Another thing that comes to mind and, and I, and um, Harmel and the Ciceroian Society is not unique in recognizing this, is this need to rethink the, the entire model of education. One of the ways this has been coming up um, is in uh, ministry formation. Uh, there's an organization here where I live in Holland, Michigan, called Coram Deo that is uh, pioneering this, what they're, what they're calling in-ministry formation. I won't get into this. I'm hoping to do that for another podcast. But the idea is that you you find people in the communities or in the churches in this case um, that are already demonstrating leadership and a call on their life to do this or that. Perhaps it's to ordain ministry, but it might be to well. You seem to be called to be a teacher. You seem to be called to be this and this. And instead of saying go away to that university way over there and get your credentials away from this community and away from this place that you've been called to, it says well what what about right here. You're developed, and you're and, and we and, and you're fed into, and you're you're formed in the in the place where you uh, were born, or where, where where you were called to, um, so that you're it's it's not I go get formed in this um, faraway place in kind of this hermetically sealed um, dorm room, um, but I'm I'm formed where I'm I'm going to be working as, as it is because I think there's there's a very what I like about what you said is, uh, you know, don't romanticize this, but it's also, you know, what a, what you know what a Harmel Academy would look like is it's not going to be the same um, in Nashville or Charlotte or uh, Miami or San Francisco. It's all going to be different because the needs of that place are different. Now the humanities program might be the same because we're all similar uh, uh, as humans, but um, I think I think there's something about that, and also. I think this romanticism, which I I could I could certainly be guilty of. I think um, I've met more than one person who, and I've been guilty of this romanticizing the agricultural life, for example. But anybody who spends I don't know uh, three hours in the field will be like, this is not romantic at all. <laughs> you know, there, is, <laughs> no. there is there's a lot of heat. There's bugs. Everything breaks all the time. You have to wake up in ungodly hours. Um, and uh, yeah, there's there, there's a lot to be said. But I will say this though. I think this model of whether it's in ministry or in trade or in whatever community formation, that 
you're less uh, you're less likely to romanticize it or idealize it than you were than you might have been in a university setting. Because mm. in a university setting, you're constantly dealing, and this is not true of everybody, but you're constantly dealing with um, the world out there, the real world, as they say in the university, right, as an abstraction, you know, as as a, as a textbook version. So when I taught politics, it, you know, I never wanted to idealize politics, which you know it it'd be hard to do that anyway, but. Um, it was important that, that the students understood, like, politics is messy and dirty. Yes, we need to follow, look at the Constitution and the laws, but there's not a perfect formula. There's not a... The, the, the textbook can only take you so far. Don't idealize this. Be ready to get in the mess. Be ready to get dirty. Be ready to get, you know, your, 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 your knuckles bloody, your feelings hurt, um, because that's, that's life. And to me, that seems to be what what you all are doing. And so, I, I just want to give you a chance to respond to that, and then we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll conclude. That, that's lovely. I, I I think I think what you said at the beginning and at the end are are related in an important way. Mm-hmm. This, this question of the abstraction, right? Mm-hmm. And, and again, Matthew Crawford, I think, deals with this very well in his work, um, and in a way that I think almost completely comports, I think, with a, a, a Christian theology of work. Um, the abstraction can be a danger, a, a significant danger. But the question then becomes is, okay, so uh, yes, uh, what, is a real wor- what does that real world encounter look like um, in such a way that not only dispels the romanticism, that's sort of like dealing with the, the potential negative, but what is the positive we're being drawn to in that? And that's also in my mind where there's a lot of work to be done because in my mind that's, that's in, in part a failure of uh, formation but more fundamentally a failure of formation of imagination. And this goes back to where you started is, is you know, um, is, is the work of the people and life is liturgy and these sorts of things. Okay, yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that sort of language either. But, but there's something in there that I think is worth looking at. As you said, you know, helping people in their vocation learn to serve Christ. But the question should be, but serve him in doing what? Mm-hmm. What is he doing? Right. And, and, and that's actually, the, I mentioned our, our first semester at Harmel is built around understanding their apprentice apprentice to Christ. Well, what is it that he's doing? And we just, we tell the men that, you know, your, and this is a, a point coming out of Alexander Schmemann's uh, lovely book for the life of the world, but essentially your core vocation is as a priest. And what we mean by that is, is that God creates the world out of his sheer goodness and love. But there's one part of material creation that has an especial uh, a gift, right? It's all a gift, but one part has a special gift, which is the ability to recognize the gift and to offer thanks for it. And, and, and that's man's first and highest calling. Now, obviously, we fail in this due to the fall. But this is what Christ is doing on the cross and in our redemption. Not simply making up for our sins, although of course he's doing that, sanctifying the human race, yes he's doing that, but what he's, he is doing is he is offering the world in thanksgiving back to the Father in Eucharist on, as a part of and on behalf of creation. And this, this priestly calling, this is what Christ is doing, this is, this is the part of our human vocation that he is fulfilling, and this is what our work itself is meant to be united to. And so, to speak in liturgical language, right, it is what is work? Or to use the words of the Mass, what is the work of human hands? Well, the story can be understood this way. God gives us the material world, and we contribute our creativity and collaboration in its elevation from, for example, the fruits of agriculture, wheat, and we turn it into a higher form, bread. And then what we do is we offer that creation back to God in thanksgiving, and then he takes that gift, and then he elevates it further, and the, and, and the, and, and the work of human hands and the fruit of the vine, right? Uh, or the, the fruit of the earth and the work of human hands, the fruit of the vine and the work of human hands, he elevates those into Eucharist, and then he offers it back to us infused with his divine life, and intimacy with God and ultimately deification is the, the result of that. Now, that's what we're doing when we work. That, that exchange is what our work 
is. That's what we're doing. So it's not simply a matter of I'm in my vocation so that I can serve Christ and I can help people and I can build my community. All those things are true. All those things are true, wonderful, and holy. But it's more than that. It's more than that. And I, so I think um, all that is to say is that um, at the end of the day, reorienting our understanding of work, uh, whatever form that is in the skilled trades or any work, you know, John Paul calls work uh, the key to the social question. In other words, if you want to understand how to repair the social fissures, he says you have to understand what work is. And I contend that that narrative of what work is, is that participation and collaboration with Christ in the creation and redemption of the world and ultimately unity with him in Eucharist, that is what work is. And that's what we have to recover. David, this is such an encouraging conversation, and I, I wish we could keep uh, going uh, for, for a long time, but we need to, need to give our listeners some, uh, some, a, a break here. Um, I, want to, I want us to finish uh, with just g- tell everyone how to get a hold of you, or, and at least how to learn more about Harmel Academy. Um, if, if you're a student out there and you're interested in applying to this program, how do you do it? Uh, just a, a quick rundown of that. Yeah, well, everything you would need to know. Uh, you can find it at harmelacademy.org. And uh, yeah, we are, uh, we're still young, and we are very eager to have um, not only uh, students from all over, uh, we're also eager to have partners of all sorts. Um, and so it, the reality is, is we're a very small little entity, and we, we need people's help. And so we're welcome uh, that the, the way to that health is by offering help. So if there's anyone who is interested in contacting us or talking more about this, we'd be more than happy. There's contact information at Harmel Academy ORG, and um, we'd be happy to hear from any and all comers. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, David. Well, thank you very much. Yes, and you have been listening to The Sower, a production of the Ciceronian Society. If you enjoyed this conversation, I'd like to meet more people like David um, and probably some other Red Wings fans. Uh, We hope you'll consider joining us for our 2024 conference in Plano, Texas, February 29th through March 2nd, 2024. Panel and paper proposals are due by September 1st, 2024. Hopefully this goes out uh, before then. And more information can be found on our website at ciceronianssociety.org. Please be sure to rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Thank you for listening.